CEE Central Europe Explained An IDM podcast series powered by Erste Group New and old player into the game part 2 the United States with Dardis McNamee Hello everybody and welcome back to CEE Central Europe Explained my name is Emma Unterberry. I am in charge of the podcast production at the Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe in Vienna. Last week, Ivana Kreiskova and Martin Atalik discussed the old and new player of China in the region. Following up that discussion, today's episode is focusing on the relationships between the United States and Central Europe. For this, I am really glad to discuss these topics with the American-Austrian journalist, Dallas McNamee. Hello, Dardis, and thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. So, Dardis, you are currently a joint chief of the City Regional Magazine website and platform Metropole. You have a long career in journalism as you have written for the New York Times, Colinas Traveler in New York, the Wall Street Journal Europe, and its fight in Vienna. As well, you were a speechwriter to two US ambassadors to Austria. So this is a very impressive resume that is much bonded between the two regions, the US and Central Europe. So first, I would like to go back to January 2021. We witnessed a change of leadership in which Donald Trump left his seat in the White House to Joe Biden. However, Trump's presidential term has had impacts on the US foreign politics, which, as a matter of fact, affected Central Europe. We have seen the US building new skepticism toward the EU cooperation and multilateral institutions such as NATO. More than that, a new focus has grown on business interests and security instead of values. So concretely, Dardis, what are the consequences of Donald Trump's presidential term for Central and Eastern Europe? How have those four years affected the region? Yes, well, uh, there's, you know, bad news and good news. I mean, the the, the bad news is that Trump didn't really believe in diplomacy generally. He believed in making a deal that made him look good and he was interested, he claimed, in American economic and trade interests. But in fact, uh, much of what he did with the tariffs and whatever was destructive in that regard. But in terms of Central Europe, the good news is that he made talked about things but didn't actually do very much. So the harm that could have happened of, uh, for instance, his defunding of NATO, which would have been a disaster for Central Europe, never actually happened. And so this was, I think, most of Central Europe, with a couple of exceptions that we'll talk about, um, most of Central Europe sighed a huge sigh of relief when Biden was elected uh, instead of Trump, as did the rest of Europe, where in general, the approval ratings, you know, uh, for Biden over Trump were sort of around the two thirds level in the 60s, 65%, 68% in Austria, about that a little bit lower. And in, in much of Central Europe, uh, certainly the Western part of Central Europe, with the exception of Hungary, also. So this is good. The, but the interesting thing is that the the major things that Trump claimed that he had done in a positive way for Central Europe, which mostly had to do with Poland, where he had made a, formed a very warm bond, were actually initiatives that of Biden and Obama under the Obama presidency. I mean, there was, I think the, uh, the main thing was this European reassurance initiative, which was to put troops on the ground again in Poland that had been removed earlier and to and an expansion or sort of a re- Regeneration uh, of NATO's presence called the, I think it was it, the Enhanced Forward Presence um, that was underway. But the main thing was this European Reassurance Initiative, which had, I think, 4,000, between 4,000 and 5,000 troops on the ground in Poland. And that was increased very slightly under Trump. But this is very important because Poland, along with the Baltics, this, these are the people the countries in Central Europe that are most worried about pressure from Russia. And therefore, for them, NATO really matters. So Trump's sort of saber rattling and saying, I'm going to defund NATO must have terrified them. 
They never actually said that, though, and basically the emotional relationship of sort of one authoritarian government to another authoritarian government or attitude uh, made them quite comfortable with each other, and, and uh, Trump had even invited Duda to Washington to put his arm around him on the eve of the election and this kind of thing. So in that sense, you would think that they would be very, very upset that Trump had lost. But the reality is that is that these programs, the Defense Initiative, the European Reassurance Initiative, and the NATO Enhanced Forward Presence, those were actually things enacted under Obama. But the NATO Enhanced Presence was carried out actually under Trump, the man who said he wanted to defund NATO. So it, you know, the, Trump was full of contradictions, which was a good thing because that meant that very little happened. But also. He acted as if he didn't think Europe mattered in general and tried to say that his interest was with Russia or was with China and that Europe was, you know, uh, unimportant and they should be paying their own way and it's not America's problem and all of that sort of thing. So Central Europe, in a way, became, inherited some of the damage of this diminished interest in Europe, but on the other hand, had a special place for Trump because of Poland and because of Hungary and their openness to uh, warmer relationships with Russia, which Trump claimed was his thing. The other thing was Trump really didn't like Angela Merkel at all and because because she wasn't impressed by him and didn't, you know. So Central Europe became sort of the center of a sandwich between Germany and Russia that uh, Trump was interested in. So in this case, would you say the interest that Trump had in Central Europe was actually in only in order to push the Russian security and the Chinese economic threats? And did he actually implement a push against Russia and China or was it kind of a utopia? Well, Trump did a lot of damage domestically. He didn't really, and, in, and internationally, the main damage he caused was the, the were the tariffs where he really interrupted supply lines, uh, supply uh, relationships for certain kinds of commodity products, particularly things like lumber or soybeans or you know various things like this. In terms of diplomacy, I don't know that very much happened that will have long-term damage, except for the fact that that he existed at all and this long, long continuity of 60 years of, of American foreign policy after World War II that Democrat or Republican was largely consistent in most of the major things. Trump started saying, well, I'm not going to pay my dues at the UN and I'm going to withdraw from the World Trade Organization and I'm going to pull out of the Paris Climate Accords and I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to defund NATO. And, you know, these are, were terrifying things that he said. And fortunately, the World Health Organization and the Paris Peace Accords and paying the dues at the UN could be reversed overnight, which Biden has done, fortunately. And that happened when he had this big pile of executive orders he was signing on his desk. And, and you know, one after the other, I think Paris was first and the UN was second. I mean, I don't know, but they all happened within about two days, uh, reversing those things. But I think many people just sighed this collective sigh of relief and Biden would say, well, America's back. And so, well, yes, but it's going to take a while before people really trust this again. And so what we have to watch is, I mean, I think Biden has a great character. He is consistent, long haul player. You know, he's we've been in the Senate for decades and he knows how the Senate works. He knows how the Congress works. And having had served two terms with Obama, he knows how the administration works and the executive works. And and so I think we're lucky in this regard, where he's someone who thinks that actually governing matters and he knows how to do it. Uh, he's an old man. And so with luck, you know, he has enough really smart people working for him so he doesn't get too tired. And I mean, that to me, in a way, the thing I worry about most is that he's going to wear himself out trying to fix all this stuff. 
what you just said bring me to my next question, which is which future perspective should we actually expect from Biden? Because as you said, he brings a lot of hope to the relationship between Europe and the US. He's been saying with Kamala Harris on his campaign brochure that he wants to affirm Americans' commitment to NATO and end the Trump administration's pandering to Vladimir Putin. So which future, which is the most realistic to happen actually with Biden as US president? Well, I think there's no question about his full-blooded support for NATO and his understanding of its importance. Those two initiatives from the Obama administration that were the ones probably almost the only things embraced by Trump uh, in relation to Poland and the Baltics and sort of the eastern edge of, of the European Union. Think about that title, European Reassurance Initiative. And Biden was the architect of this plan. It wasn't just that he was there and Obama did this. He was the one who actually designed it. And so he really thinks that an American presence in Central Europe, which includes Germany, this, is, this really matters. And, uh, and I'm sure that this will certainly be sustained at its current level. And I think there's a good chance it's going to be expanded. Um, in terms of Russia, the other thing that with all of Trump's cozying up to, to Putin, he never actually suspended the... Uh, sanctions. And, and Biden is certainly going to continue those uh, uh, as a response to Russia's uh, incursions in Ukraine and his, you know, taking over uh, Crimea and, and uh, the strip of the battleground area in eastern Ukraine. And in fact, I, I actually, from where we live in America, we know two young men who were posted in Ukraine just last year, a year before. And uh, they were there for about a year and a half. And um, so that there is an American presence there in the eastern section of Ukraine as well at this time. And I'm sure that that will stay there. The, the very scary thing, though, about in the terms of the America prefers to use soft power at this period in history. I mean, and, and, and Putin is perfectly willing to call up the army. So would you say actually that Joe Biden's presidency brings hope as well to the Poles and to Ukraine because they are very scared of their relationship with Russia? Yes, I do. I think that uh, Biden's clarity about NATO and this reassurance initiative say this very, very clearly. And his you know, completely saying, you know, coming back and saying that these uh, international institutions are fundamental and really important and America is not pulling out of those. You know, America is coming back into them and standing behind them. So, but what I do think is that he's extremely serious about whatever non-military tools are available, among which is a physical presence in the country. So is also this soft power something people in Central Europe we put hope inside? Well, yeah, I mean, well, if, if, if you're not uh, Viktor Orban, yeah. He, he has said repeatedly, and he said it actually in his inaugural address, and he said it again in a couple of public statements since, that, that American foreign policy is about values. You know? and, and so this we get back to with the EU's struggles at the moment with, uh, you know, with particularly Viktor Orban, but also a bit with Poland, and uh, are over the rule of law and the, the clarity and saying no to the uh, censorship of the press and saying no to, you know, the undermining of the courts and the attempt to manipulate the courts and these kinds of things. And so this is what Biden has said repeatedly, that American foreign policy is going to be about values. Uh, how they're going to handle a situation like Hong Kong, I have no idea. You know, we'll have to, we'll have to see. But I, I certainly think that in uh, they see the EU as an essential ally of values to the United States. And uh, I mean, I'm curious, I, I don't know who was speaking in the back room, but this decision of the European People's Party to finally make the decision and tell Orban he's no longer welcome in, without changing his tune. So now he claims he's quit, but I don't know which, you know, <laughs> which one is the actual final push. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Orban's sense that the EU now and America are standing on the same side and it's a values administration that 
his chance of winning the bullying tactic are less good. But it's very, very clear. Uh, and I think this will be one of the roles assigned to Kamala Harris, but we'll have to see. But I mean, she is a prosecutor, you know, and she is a, you know, uh, a human rights lawyer. And as a senator, these were issues that interested her. So this is a possible assignment for her, whether that will happen or not, I don't know. I, but Biden's record is so consistent over so many decades about this. Uh, I, I would be very surprised if they don't put someone at a very high level uh, in this assignment. To finish with, continuing between this dichotomy between the Trump's administration and the Biden's administration, yeah. if we look at the legacy left from the past to Biden now regarding Kosovo and also the agreement which was signed in Washington, under the Trump's administration. Do you think this is an actual hope for the um, Southeastern region, having Biden as the president now, as we have seen a lot of he fears arising because Biden didn't clearly mention the belgrad pristina dialogue? Oh, yeah. Well, Trump really stirred up the pot in Kosovo. You know, and he sent John Bolton over there, who is not known for his ability to de-escalate tension. And the US supported the vote of no confidence against uh, Kurti, Alvin Kurti, the prime minister. And he was out of office again two months after he was elected. So this was not really very helpful for stability and thinking that they could force uh, a land swap to close this thing and then be told that they're heroes because then this is all resolved and then Serbia can pursue its application for EU membership which I think is an essential, I don't think the EU will consider their membership unless that gets solved. Biden, I doubt Biden would have anything to do with a land swap solution to that problem. I, I would be astonished. This is completely against anything, you know, of uh, territorial imperatives. And, you know, since Bush and through Obama, the US has recognized Kosovo formally. So uh, I think, what they will try to do is find a way to mediate and help everybody feel safe and secure and have and Serbia decide that this is gonna have to be okay. But that the United States probably has ways of, of being supportive of Serbia in other ways with trade or with, uh, I don't know, equipment or machinery or technology, or I don't know, something else that they can say, well, you know, or we can help you. I mean, this, this other initiative, the uh, Three Seas Initiative, this is very, very interesting because this is all about infrastructure. This is about taking all of these countries in Central Europe, that, in the post-communist countries that while the EU has done you know, a really super job in some of the main highways and autobahns and things and connect and building and ports, that was the other big thing the EU did were, were countries with uh, antiquated port facilities and container shipping and things like this. But there's a lot left to do. And in particularly in the Southeast and in the e Eastern part of Eastern Europe, less got done. And of course not in Serbia because it wasn't in the EU. So they have yet, to benefit from any of that. So it, it strikes me that's an area where the US could come in and say, if we can make this kind of settlement, this three seas initiative, which with luck will actually come to pass and actually get launched, uh, which the United States was very much behind, then that could be something that could help make it work for Serbia. Uh, but we'll, we'll have to see. But I mean, I think this three seas thing is, is just brilliant because things like that can help in, in at least gradually counteract the brain drain and counteract the, you know, the population losses and things like this, because it's hard for some kinds of businesses to actually have any kind of distribution chains because they don't have the, the systems there to market their goods. And Romania, for instance, has a wonderful wine industry. You know, and when Austrian, Austrian vintners hot, want, need to hire people, they go to Romania because they're really good and they know what they're doing and they're hugely experienced. But the Romanian wine doesn't really have an international distribution system. 
although it's enormously productive. And one of the things this Three C's initiative could do is to help create distribution chains for all sorts of local industries that would make them more interesting for the next generation and make them want to stay there instead of going away. Which also the Mini Schengen Initiative tries to implement as well with yeah. bringing trades from the southeastern Europe on the more global level, which would be a topic that we will discuss actually in our next episode. Oh, great. Yeah, that's, the, the, you see, there are a series of these things and they all sort of weave together. They're all sort of different pieces of a whole larger system. And, and I would be, I would not be the least bit surprised if this is one of the things that Biden is going to try to do as he was the architect of the NATO reinforcement and the reassurance mm -hmm. plan. Danis, thank you very much for your expertise and such an interesting insight. We could talk all afternoon. There's so much to say. Mm, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for listening. This was CEE, Central Europe Explain, new and old players into the game, an IDM podcast series powered by Esther Group. We are looking forward to the next episode and see you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye. IDM Podcast. Institut für den Donauraum und Mitteleuropa. Institut für die Danube Region und Central Europe. European Perspectives. Regional Actions. Cooperation and Expertise since 1953.